Then from World War II, ex parte Quarant that the FDR had used, they, they reached back and said, hey, look at that. We can go ahead and, and use military tribunals against these militia people, their military enemies. Now imagine if Clinton had listened to that advice. What would have happened? Anybody have any idea what would happen? So Bill Clinton starts to round up people in the black bag in the middle of the night. No indictment by a grand jury. No jury trial. Just grab you and try you by military tribunal to the militia movement. What would have happened? So yeah. the streets. They'd have, they'd have, the worst nightmare would have come true. Their suspicion, and not too far off the mark, was that he intended to destroy the Bill of Rights and, and unleash power against them. He would have proved them right. And yeah, it would have been a civil war. But guess what? That was legal theory back then, these, these two. They were trying to update and expand precedents. But guess what's happened since then? The precedents, the precedents that the updated case law that Clinton did not have at his fingertips is now in place, put in place by the Bush administration. So now Obama has in his hand power that Clinton could never have dreamed about, rubber stamped and supported by the Supreme Court. That's where we are. So that's why I started Oath Keepers. And Katrina had a big, you know, big impact too. If they're going to use the troops here at home, they better know the Constitution. They better understand the Bill of Rights. So that's been our mission since we started. <clears throat> but it's not enough. We can't just simply sit on our butts mm -hmm. and tell the current serving, you know, eating my chips and drinking my beer and watching the UFC. I can't just say, you know, please, current serving police officer and soldier, don't violate the Bill of Rights while I sit here on my ass. We can't do that. We have to get up and we have to resurrect the foundations of a free republic that the founders gave us. And that means taking personal responsibility for our security, taking personal responsibility to make sure we have food to eat, and make sure that we've got system of communication set up. So in case what happened yesterday in Egypt happens here. What happened yesterday in Egypt? The government pulled the plug on the internet. Turned off Twitter and everything. What's that? They turned off Twitter and yeah, everything. all of it. Everything. And I was thinking, Joe Lieberman. Test. In my yeah. head. Test. Wow. That was a test. That was a test. Yeah, I mean, something happened here. So my point is, is that like a lot of guys are there said, hey, the militia, the militia is there to to as a last resort in case the government becomes oppressive, we have a you know recourse to arms. Well, they're missing a huge part of the puzzle. The militia is supposed to be the military force for domestic deployment security, to repel invasions, suppress insurrections, and to execute the laws of the union. The federal government is supposed to be reliant dependent on you going along. If they want to enforce what you consider to be an unconstitutional law, and you're the militia, and you are their only option for domestic enforcement or execution of their laws, how can they do it without your acquiescence? They can't, right? That's the point of the militia, is to make a standing army, a large standing army, unnecessary, and to fill that vacuum that the military power is with the people. And so the federal government can't do anything to them. They can't oppress them because they are, they are the force. They can't make you oppress yourselves. Okay. That's the point of the militia, to fill, that, to fill that void. When you got the militia, as we have, then they fill the standing army troops. Now where are you at then? So that's why we're reaching out to standing army troops. We have to fill that, fill that empty void ourselves. And I told the folks in Montana, you know, don't put all your eggs in, in the government basket. Don't think to yourself, well, we have to go by, like Edwin Vieira, you know, God bless his heart, he's a, he's a brilliant man. But his whole focus is, well, it has to be done by statute, because that way you have sovereign immunity. And he's right in many ways. It's nice to have, you know, the backing of your state legislature and your governor backing you up when you stand up. That can be useful. It's called the doctrine of interposition. Your, your the state government's interposing itself between you and an abusive federal government. This is what, what Jefferson and Madison invoked when they rebelled and, and stood up against the Alien Sedition Acts, right? So right out of the gate, the Constitution wasn't even dry yet. The ink wasn't dry. We did the Federalists violating the First Amendment, plain violation, 
arresting newspaper editors. You know? And so Jefferson and Madison said, well, hey, you know, the, the federal courts aren't doing jack about it because they're packed with federalists. Mm -hmm. So it's res the responsibility of the state legislatures. And the states have to stand up and say no to it. Now, sometimes I'll get people that will write into Oath Keepers and they'll say, well, wait a minute. You know, you guys have told us what you're not going to do. What are you going to do? You know, when's the Army and the Marine Corps going to, you know, you know a march on Washington, D.C. Hmm. and then root out that den of vipers? <laughs> and then what they're really calling for is a military coup. Is that the answer? Because that's it's kind of a disease we all have. Everyone looks at Washington, D.C. Everyone looks at, you know, they, they've ignored the, the states. They've ignored our counties. They've ignored all these institutions we're supposed to have. Everyone's focused on, um, you know, the big federal government infrastructure, the military, you know, federal law enforcement, and all that, the courts. And so they, they seek for a silver bullet, and I see increasingly calls for a military coup. That'd be like going from the frying pan to the fire. You would still have the destruction of the Constitution. You would have the destruction of freedom. I don't want to live under some, some MacArthur wannabe in sunglasses any more than I want to live under an Ursula Big President. That's not the answer. The answer, Madison and Jefferson gave us the answer. The states have an obligation to stand up and interpose themselves between the feds and their people. And same goes for counties. That's so why the county sheriff is important too. So, but anyway, don't put all your eggs in that one basket though. Don't just say, okay, when the county commissioners um, create the committee of safety with the sheriff on it and the police chief, you know, and, and the fire chief and all that, and they, they write the, the ordinances for militia, then I'll join the militia. You shouldn't be thinking that way. Um, while you're waiting for that to happen, you're pushing for it, you should also be starting neighborhood watches mutual aid associations and getting yourself squared away because time might just run out we'll try to build both like two pillars one's in the public sphere one's in the private sphere try to build them both at the same time get constitutional sheriffs elected um, support them with the posse you know get yourself a county militia a real honest to goodness county government militia not that you would, would get paid you're still a volunteer you know when you when you approach a county commissioner your attitude should be, it won't cost you a cent, county commissioner. We will provide our own gear. We'll get volunteers from around the, around the county. We'll get donations around the country, which you would. It would happen. Don't worry about the money, because right now they're strapped for money anyway. And as a, as a principle of freedom, it's better to be a true volunteer, right? Like I was, when I went to Montana as a young lawyer, or new, new lawyer, I don't say young, but new lawyer, the first thing I did is I joined my volunteer fire department there in a small town I moved to. And all the other lawyers were like, what are you doing? You know, you're a busy young, you know, starting out attorney. How could you, why do you, how can you have any time for this kind of stuff? You know, answering phone, or uh, radio calls in the middle of the night for an accident on the highway. I said, I have to. It's my duty to do this. So, so this is, the next, next best thing we got to a militia left, unfortunately, is a volunteer fire department. That's the closest thing. So that's the spirit you want to approach it in. You just give us the, the sanction of the county commissioners. And we will take care of the rest. Because that does give you such sovereign immunity. It does put you in a position of now you can, you can play one sovereign against another. You can say, OK, the sovereign state of Montana, for example, now has county militias. And hey, and since we're a military force, by God, we're going to have anti-tank anti weapons and tows and dragons. And we're going to have you know, anti-aircraft weapons and all the things you would have <laughs> to repel an invasion. Let's be strong to repel an invasion, right? So, but you have a state sanction, and so now what are they going to do? I mean, for decades they told us it's only about the right of states to have a militia. Well, fine. Let's do it. Let's get a militia together. But while you're waiting for that to be built up, at the same time, you get to know your neighbors, get yourself squared away with neighborhood watches. And the same thing goes for, for sound money. Same exact idea. You get sound money statutes passed, ordinances, uh, even down to the, at, the, at the town level, town, county, state. Work your way up. But while you're doing that, start using silver and gold yourself, whether it's a little e-card or whatever it is. Start now. Barter amongst your friends and, 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 your, and your neighbors. Go to the local, local producer and say, hey, you know, your local farmer's market, will you take gold and silver? Or tell the local, local uh, grocery store chain, if you will take gold and silver for payment, 
we pledge, this name of list of 500 names or whatever it is in the community, we pledge we will not shop at Walmart. Woo! We'll yeah. keep all our money low. Woo! Okay? We'll give it to you if you will start taking silver. And they will. You know, if you start showing up with, with a list of names of folks that will do this and they pledge on their honor to do it, they'll start doing it. Because whenever you go spend money at Walmart, where's it go? It goes out of your community, it's not staying in your community. So we got to build strong, resilient local economies, alternate markets, so that fiat system co collapses, we can fall back on something else, okay? So, and the third one was, was food security. If you can't eat, you're dead, right? Used to be during the Cold War, this nation had three years grain reserve for its citizenship. What's it got now? Do you know what it is? What? Enough to give all of us, every person in the United States, a half a loaf of bread. No. That's it. That's all they've got in Green Reserve. Wow. So that's why you can't trust D.C. to take care of you. You know, like Ray Epps does or other Mormons do, you need to have your own food security, your own Green Reserve. And I want to encourage, like, VFW Hall, the message to them is going to be, you in the hall, whether it's, whether it's Marine Corps League, VFW, American Legion, whatever veterans group, they can do it themselves. They don't got to come and do it with Oath Keepers. I don't, they, don't, they don't need to join my organization to do this. The VFW hall could, could get beans and, and rice and wheat. It's really cheap to buy bags of, of rice and beans. They could just store it there in the hall for themselves and their families. And then when they got enough for themselves, then start storing extra for their community. No reason why we can't do this. Food bank. Okay, cheap food insurance. Okay. And the fourth, fourth point we talked about was state sovereignty and reserve powers. But it's kind of hard for the state to stand up to the feds when they're sucking on the federal tip. Okay? Yeah. It's just, I hate to be crude, but that's just the way it is. It's just so bile coming out of it. We gotta wean, ah! They got to wean themselves off of it. You can't, it's, it's hypocritical for a state to take federal money and grants and for all the cops to take all kinds of federal goodies and armed personnel carriers and helicopters and night vision devices and all that stuff, you know. And then to say, well, we're going to stand up on, on state sovereignty. It's hypocritical. States have got to wean themselves off of that. And you can help them do that. Because the more resilient, more independent, more secure you are in your state as a, as a people, the less you'll need that money from Washington, D.C. The easier it will be to wean yourselves. So anyway, that's what we talked about in Montana. That's going to be kind of the thrust of Oath Keepers. We'll still reach out to the current serving, of course. But our message to veterans is that they have to take a personal responsibility. It's kind of like a religious revival in some ways. You know, I'm a, I'm a, like a traveling preacher. My goal is to is to talk to them about having a personal relationship with the Constitution. Get to know, get, go read it yourself. You know, don't wait for the Pope to tell you what it means. The the like like Michael would say, some some some. Uh, Black wear and deity. drag, you know, what's that? <laughs> Black robe deity. Yeah, yeah. Parts. Don't, you know, it's, 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 it, and religion's kind of the same thing. We should be like Martin Luther, right? You don't need some guy babbling in Latin to tell you what, what, what the word of God means. You go read it yourself. And it comes to quite a stir, right? Same thing here. They don't, that's why they don't like what we're doing when it comes to the current serving. They're going to lose their minds when they hear what we're doing with veterans. If I can reach into the chest of every veteran in this country, grab a hold of their heart, and make them realize that if they are going to save this country, they must take a personal responsibility to, to, to resurrect these institutions, personal responsibility for their own security and their own, they're providing for their own families and their neighbors too. If I can do that, then we can save it. I really do think it's, you know, I wouldn't say it's all the answer, but it's a big friggin' chunk. Because then when the collapse happens, if, if, if collapse happens right now, we'll be so desperate and destitute that most people will go along with whatever the powers that be have planned just to feed their families. And conversely, the military is going to be like, well, it's a real crisis. Well, you know, it's great to talk about, say, you know, you know defending the Constitution, but, but hey, they're hungry and they're starving and they're, and they're rioting in the streets. What are we going to do? So it creates more of a pretext, gives more of an excuse, and gets more of the military to go along. Not all of them will. But more dire it seems to them, the more likely they'll be to go along. Like during Katrina, a lot of them went along with it because it's like, well, this is a real emergency, you know. So that's what we have to do. This is our part of the equation. 
We want them to not be bad and to not be tools of oppression. But on the 